Norwegian explorer whose dream was to go to the North Pole. To, to be the first person to actually be documented in history as exploring the North Pole. And so he began to get resources together and he began uh, to make plans and get a team together. And while he was doing that, word came to him that an American had already made it to the North Pole. And I can just imagine his dream was shattered, but he said, you know what, then we'll go to the South Pole. And so he continued to get funding and he continued to get his crew together and all the things that they would need. And in uh, October of 1911, they left on their journey. And they went through, as you can imagine, all kinds of heartache and difficulties trying to make it to the South Pole. And they were racing another team that was headed from the opposite direction. And so as they're going, you know, they're just getting prepared and they get close. And when they get close to the South Pole, his team says, we want you to go first. Okay, this, this has been your dream. We, we want you to go, and, and you go and plant the Norwegian flag right there, okay? You, you put it there. And so he goes, and, and he plants that flag, and he's beat just by a matter of days this other explorer. And the, the men that were with him said, say something. Okay, you, you've done it. You fulfilled this dream, so say something. And his sentence was very short. It was very profound, and it was very sad. Ronaldo Amunderson said, I wanted to go to the North Pole. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I mean, he had done something very significant. He's going to be known as the man who first explored the South Pole, but he couldn't get over the shattered dream that he had in his life, that he wanted to be the first one to go to the North Pole. I don't know about you, but as a kid, I'll, I like to dream. And I like to just imagine what the world was going to be like and what I was going to do. So I want you to take just a, a few seconds right now, turn to somebody next to you, and tell them a dream you had as a child. Okay, something that you wanted to do or be when you grew up. All right, go ahead. Tell somebody near you. For me, it started when I was very young. I was about five years old. I wanted to be a garbage man. It was my dream because my dad was a garbage man. And I thought that was awesome. You got to ride around on the back of a truck. And then later I decided my dream was I wanted to be a professional musician. And I wanted to be able to travel the world and play music. And it, I just learned I wasn't that good. So, so that wasn't going to happen either. I even wanted to be a police officer at one time. And I had all of these things that I set up and I said, these are things that I want to do. And, and, and they just didn't happen. And I think as kids, we picture and, and go, there's nothing in the world that I can't do. And we set these really high goals and we have these dreams. And we say, we're going to be able to attain these. But then we become adults and we quit remembering how to dream. We, we just stop dreaming, and, and maybe it's not that we just forget how to dream, it's life happens, right? And our dreams are shattered, and, and bad things happen, and, and life doesn't go the way that we want it to, and so for adults, it's just safer not to dream. I can just imagine that there are people who would say, you know, as a kid, hey, I want to be fill in the blank. This is what I'm going to do with my life. And, and maybe they said, I'm going to be a, a dentist. Or I'm going to be a teacher or a carpenter. Or, or just whatever their dream was. And I want to do this. And, and then they look now and go, but I had to do this. I didn't get to do what I wanted to. I didn't get to have this amazing career that I was picturing. And I just had to settle. And I just had to do what needed to be done. Maybe at one time you thought, you know what? By a certain age, I am going to be so well off. That if I want to retire, I can retire early. Or maybe I have to go all the way to retirement age, but by the time I get there, man, there's going to be this nest egg, and I am just going to be able to enjoy life. And that was your dream, and now you're going, retire? I can never retire. You know, death is going to be the only thing that allows me to retire. And we go, now my dream was to be financially secure, but now look where I am. And, and, and maybe you thought, well, I'm going to get a job where I can make enough money where my family can live completely comfortable. 
that we can have everything that we need, but then you look on this side and you go, man, I don't even know if I can pay the bills at the end of the month. And I'm going, oh, man, I'm going to have to get a second job or a third job, or I'm going to have to try to get overtime. I'm going to have to try to do something. And the dream of being financially secure, taking care of your family, man, you're struggling over here. And it's not a dream anymore because you're just barely making it. Maybe you thought, I'm going to find Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. And I'm going to marry them, and we're going to have this long marriage, and it's going to be the stuff that movies are made of. You know, Romeo and Juliet kind of stuff, except the dying part. You know, it's just going to, it's going to be awesome. And you said, that's the way marriage is going to be. And, and maybe now you're on the other side and, and you're divorced. Maybe more than once. Or maybe the thing you never dreamed or never imagined would happen, you're widowed. Your spouse died. And you thought, that's not the way it was supposed to happen. We were supposed to live and be married for 50 or 60 years, and, and your dreams have been shattered. But maybe you did marry the person that you really wanted to marry, and, and maybe you didn't, but you did later, and, and, and life is going good, and you, you start talking about kids, and you're like, yeah, we're going to have the best kids ever. They're going to be the best looking. They're going to be the smartest. They're just going to be awesome kids. And you dreamed about these kids and then you had them. And you're like, what happened? You know, it's like, they're just not. And, and what we don't realize is kids are a byproduct of their parents. So they're not going to be perfect. And we look back and we have these dreams and we go, here's what they're going to do. They're going to become this. They're going to do that. And we go, that's what it's going to look like when my kids, as they're growing up, it's the kids that everybody goes, man, I wish I had those children. <laughs> Greatest children in the world. And we get on this side and we go, that's not the way my life has happened. That's not what I was picturing. And if your dreams get shattered enough, you forget how to dream. And you just stop dreaming. But it can even be worse than that because when you go through difficult situations that you can't understand, a divorce or the death of somebody uh, early in life or your kids make decisions that you don't want them to and you've lost a job and gotten another job and lost that job and, and finances are crazy and you get in the middle of all that, you may just ask yourself, God, where are you? Okay, I, I thought... That when I had a relationship with you, that meant my dreams were going to come true. And the dreams that I had as a child or as a teenager, as a young adult, they're supposed to come true. And God, I don't know where you are. And then you may begin to doubt yourself. You begin to th say things like, well, maybe God doesn't really love me. May maybe I messed up one time too many. And God goes, you know what? I gave you all the breaks that you need. And, and so you've used them all up. Sorry. Sorry. And we can begin to fundamentally question who God is. And that can be a very, very dark place to be. I've been in dark places. Emotionally. Only a couple of times I've been very, very blessed in, in, in my years. But I know what it's like. And I got a feeling that there's some of you that are there now. But this morning you're in a very, very dark place. You say, Tim, I haven't dreamed in years because they never come true. I have a hard time trusting God because when I do go out there, when I, when I, when I do, I, I make a plan, I dream a little, it just doesn't seem to happen. And so I just don't want to dream anymore. If that's where you are, I want God to speak to you today. Maybe you've been in a dark place and, and maybe you're coming out of it. Maybe things are getting a little better. It's light at the end of the tunnel. And you're going, okay, maybe it's safe to dream again that I hope God will speak to your heart today as well. And if you're just living the dream and life could not get any better for you and you just go, man, everything. Checked it off my list. Every dream has come true. Then I hope this speaks to you as well and that you are grateful for the dreams that have come true. But for all of us, as we get ready to go into this, how about we just take a minute and we pray together. Will you do that with me? Bow your heads. God, I don't know where we are this morning exactly. I believe there are some here that they don't dream anymore because they're in a dark place. Their dreams have been shattered, it seems like, at every turn. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to their heart. 
And for those who are, are coming out of the darkness, who are beginning to dream again, just give them faith to believe and to trust you. And for those that are doing well, Father, I pray that they would see their blessings and they would not just hoard them, but they would reach out to people who've forgotten how to dream, who are struggling to dream, and they would just minister to them. But Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word so that we hear your voice and that we would know that you're there. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you look in Scripture, there are people in the Bible who had dreams. Some dreams came true, others didn't. I can't help but think of Moses. You remember Moses? Man, he goes into Egypt to free the Jews from 400 years of slavery. And God does these amazing miracles through him. And, and he gets those people out and they go out into the desert, but then they don't do what God asks. And so for 40 years, they wander around the desert. He, Moses leads these people through good and bad, ups and downs. And they're getting to the point where they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And, and this is the land that was promised all the way back to Abraham. And they've been learning about this all their lives and hearing the stories. And man, it's going to be time. They're going to go in and they're going to get the promised land. And, and, and I just know Moses is excited. And God goes, yeah, you're not going. And can you imagine? I mean, I, I, I feel like Tim would have argued and went, God, come on. Come on, I mean, 40 years, I think I've earned the right, this has been my dream to finally go into that land. But God said, no, you're not going into the land. He got to see it, but he didn't get to go in it. And I wonder, man, I bet, I bet that was a tough, tough dream to have shattered. Then uh, there's others that I think about. I think about David, King David. Man, what a guy. Kills Goliath when he's a kid. Becomes a king. He's called a, a man after God's own heart. And even though he has some difficulties, he and God stay very, very close. And, and good things happen to the kingdom of Israel while he's their king. And he says, I want to build a house for you, God. Listen, I'm living in this palace and it's beautiful and this is great. But God, I want you to have house. It's not, it's not right for you to be in a tent. So he begins to make plans and he begins to collect gold and silver and bronze and all these things that are going to go into God's house. And God goes, David, you're not going to build it. I'm sorry. Listen, you're a man of war. I don't need a man of war building my house. Your son's going to build it, but you're not going to build it. And don't you know that had to be hard? I mean, he's collecting all this stuff. He's getting all the preparations knowing my dream of building God a house, it's not going to happen in, in my lifetime. I'm not going to get the opportunity to do that. And I think, man, that would have to be a pretty tough dream to be shattered. But then there's one guy, and you can read about a lot of others. But there, there's one guy that I want us to look at this morning because I just think, man, this guy, this was tough. You're talking about being in a dark place. He is going to be in a dark place literally. And he's also going to be in a dark place emotionally. But if you've got your Bibles, would you turn to Matthew chapter 11? Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look at a story of a man named John. He was called John the Baptist. John the Baptizer because that's what he did. That's what he was known for. And so that's what they called him. So you could tell the difference between this John and that John. But in John chapter 11, beginning in verse 2, it says, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, we just jumped in the middle of the story. So, so let me go back. Let me, if you know this story, let me just kind of uh, help you to, to remember if you don't know this story. John had a very unusual beginning. And I mean from the very beginning. See, his mom and dad were really, really old. They were so old that they were referred to as people who were past childbirth age. Okay, you don't get pregnant when you're his mom's age, and yet an angel came and said, you're going to be pregnant. And you're going to give birth to somebody that's going to have a very significant ministry. And so when she's really, really old, she gets pregnant. And the amazing thing is while she's pregnant, Mary gets pregnant with Jesus. 
And so she comes because Elizabeth is her cousin. She comes to visit her. And when they come together, Elizabeth says, the baby inside of my belly just leaped for joy when you got here with your baby. So when John is still in his mama's belly, something said, whoo, mercy. That is somebody right there in the womb next to me. And he was just, so it started at the very beginning. And then we don't know a lot about him except all of a sudden he comes on the scene in the Gospels and he's preaching. He's wearing camel's hair and he's eating locusts and wild honey. And he's kind of just a, a, what seems to be a crazy guy. But he's preaching repentance and he's saying, you guys need to repent because the kingdom of God is near. You need to give yourselves to God. You need to quit trying to earn uh, God's forgiveness. And you need to just repent and say, God, I, I trust you. And, and I trust that you're going to do what needs to be done in my life. And so he's preaching and he's baptizing people. He's baptizing them because they come and they say, we repent. We're sorry for the sins that we've done. And we want to be right with God. And he would baptize them. And so he's doing all these things right. He's doing all these things good. And it's never about him. Because he'll say when people ask him, you know, are you the Messiah? He'll say, no, 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 no. Listen, there's a guy coming after me. I'm not even worthy to put his shoes on and off. I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. This guy is going to be the Messiah. He is going to be God's son. He's the one that you've been looking for all of these years. It was never about him. It was always about Jesus. In fact, some of John's disciples that helped him in his ministry left him and went to follow Jesus. He did everything right. But because of what he preached, and because of talking about a king and who his wife was, John was thrown into prison. And I know we picture prison like it is on TV today, and you know, there's cable TV, and there's good meals all the time, and there's lighting, there's heat, there's air conditioning, there's beds and toilets. That wasn't prison. Okay, prison a lot of times were in caves or down underneath things and they were dark and they were damp, wet, cold, and they were bad places. And sometimes you were shackled, your feet and your hands. So I mean, you're just there. You're in misery. And that's where we find John right now. He goes from proclaiming the message of the Messiah to being in prison. And he's in that prison. And he hears about the things that Jesus is doing. He's already been witness to some of the things that Jesus has been doing. Oh yeah, John got to baptize Jesus. And then God's spirit came down as a dove and said, this is my son. In him I'm pleased. John was a part of all that, but now he's in prison and he's just wondering. And he says, when John, heard, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? This is the guy who has turned his region upside down, preaching repentance and getting back right with God. And that the Messiah is coming. This is the guy who baptized Jesus, heard the voice. And yet he's sitting in prison in a dark place. And he sends his disciples and says, will you go ask him? Are you really the one? Or is there another one coming? And we look at that and maybe you go, gosh, what weak faith. I mean, really? Come on, John. You've been seeing what's going on. You've heard the stories and then all of a sudden you're going to doubt. But think about where he is. Think about the question that he's asking. And I think it's not just Jesus, are you the Messiah? Is there another one coming? But he's saying, Jesus, do you know where I am? Do you see the place that I am? Do you see what I'm experiencing, what I'm going through? And John probably knew the verse from Isaiah chapter 61 that said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. This is describing Jesus. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. And if he knows that verse, don't you know it's in the back of his mind? He's going, if anybody deserves to be released from prison, Jesus, it's me, right? I mean, we were like kind of co-ministering. I mean, I know I was the guy that like warmed up the crowd for you. But, but I think I did a pretty good job, Jesus. And maybe in John's mind, he thought, in one day, I'm going to minister with him. You know, I mean, who would be a better disciple than the guy that's been telling everybody, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God that's come to take your sins away. And maybe he had that. Maybe his dream was, 
I'm going to get to walk this road with Jesus. I'm going to get to preach and teach and, and be a part of his team. And yet he finds himself now in prison. So was it that Jesus didn't appreciate who he was? Was it that Jesus wasn't paying attention? No, it wasn't that at all. Because in, if you skip down to verse 11, Jesus says this about John. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Really? <laughs> Jesus says, listen, there's nobody greater than this guy right here. And remember who came before him, like Elijah and Jeremiah, all these prophets. And he says, none of them. No man ever born has been better, stronger, more for God than John. And yet there's John in prison. What I want you to do is put yourself there. Because it's easy for us to sit on the outside and just go, come on, John, suck it up, buddy. Because what John knew was more than likely he's going to stay in prison or he's going to die. He just wants to know, Jesus, are you really the one? I mean, I'm in jail because I preached what I've been called to preach. I need to know if you're really going to be there. And I love Jesus' answer. Would you look at verse 4? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. He says to John's disciples, you go back and you tell John what you have seen. The blind seen, the hear, be, uh, the deaf being able to hear, leprosy being healed, all of these things. The message that John was preaching is still being preached. You go back and you tell John what you've seen. Now, if I'm John in the prison cell, I'm waiting for the disciples to get back, and, and they come and they go, John, we got a message for you from Jesus. And I'm going, yes, I'm out. Okay, he's going to do something miraculous. Something's going to happen. I'm getting out of here. And he go, they go, John, Jesus is healing people. The blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the lame are walking, people with leprosy is just healed. He's preaching the same message that you preached Hang tough, buddy. And I wonder if John went, what? 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 I don't know. I like to think he went, okay. Because that's what his life was about, was proclaiming the message. And if that's being done, if all of those things are happening, I believe it just strengthened John. And he, he remembered what he had seen. He listened to what other people had seen, and that's what built him up. That's what helped him to be strong. Scripture doesn't say that. I just, in, in my mind, I have to believe that. That when he looked back and thought about what he had seen, when he heard about what Jesus was doing, that he went, yeah, he's the one. My dream's not shattered. My dream was for people to come to repentance and come back to God. And that is happening. And it's happening in a way even greater than what I was able to do. And I think he realized then his dream was still intact. So here's what I want to say to you today. If your dreams are shattered, if you're struggling with a dream, if you're trying to dream again, just think about this. Trust what you know to be true about God. When you're struggling in life, when your dreams have been shattered, when you don't know what direction you're supposed to go in, trust what you know to be true about God. And that means you're going to have to go back and look in his word and read and see what he says there. You're going to have to go back in your life and you're going to have to look and go, I can see places where Jesus has worked in my life. I hope all of you have got those times. I hope all of you can refer back and go, yep, Jesus was working. Yep, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't have made it. And you go back and you remember and you trust the things that you know are true about God. The things that he says. And if you can't find any in your own self, look in people around you. If you can't see how God healed dreams in you, look at how he healed them in others, how he worked in their life. And maybe you just have to remember your parents or your grandparents or a child or a parent or a friend, somebody. 
But there are true things about God. And let me share some of those with you. You already read Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. So do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Doesn't that describe you when your dreams are shattered? crushed in spirit. Psalm 147.3 says he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. See, trust what you know to be true about God. That he's there, that he holds us up. When we can't hold ourselves up, he will hold us up with his righteous right hand, with the strength that he provides. No, it's true that God is there for the brokenhearted. And it may seem like you're in prison in a dark place and you're wondering, God, where are you? Jesus, where are you? And yet he's going to be there. He's going to heal. He's going to bind those broken hearts. And then remember... That God works for the good for all those who love him. But listen, who are called according to his purpose. See, I think sometimes we stop and we go, you know, good things happen. God is going to take care of. All things work for the good of those who love God. All things. Okay, God, you got to work on my 401k, buddy. <laughs> got a little struggle there. Okay, God will love you. You've got to supernaturally work on my marriage or my job or, or my children. God, you've got to do all these things because you said, but he adds a part, who have been called according to his purpose. See, I think, and Amanda and I talked about this this week. I think there are times that we, we dream, we make plans, we say this is where we're going, then we go, God, hop on board. God, come, come, come on, come on, come on. I need you. We didn't ask him one thing about it at the beginning. God, do you want us to do this? Do you want us to move this direction? Do you want us to dream this dream? And we get in the middle of it and it starts going south and we go, God, hello, where, where are you? Okay, you're supposed to be working in this for my good. I'm getting kind of crushed in spirit. Pick me up. Okay, you got to work through this thing. We need to look for God on the front side of our dreams. Say, God, this is what I'm dreaming. What do you think about this dream? You, you want to be a part of this? And if, if God's a part of it, listen to me, your dream will never fail. If God wants it done, it's going to be done. So trust what you know to be true about God when your dreams are shattered, when you're in that dark place, when you're sitting there just kind of just holding yourself going, God, I don't understand. And I don't know where you are. And if I did something to make you not like me, I want to change that. When we get in those places, remember what's true about God. That he's brought me through before. That he's going to continue to bring me through. It may be difficult. It may be one of the hardest things I go through in my life. But God's going to walk with me through it. See, it's easy for us to forget how to dream or to just decide not to dream. Because sometimes dreaming hurts. Sometimes dreaming puts us in places that we would rather not be. But when your dreams are shattered, when you're in that dark place and you're struggling to make it one step at a time, please trust what you know to be true about God. That he works in all things for your good and for his purpose. So I ask you at the beginning, or I mentioned that I don't know where you are in your dreams. I don't know if you, you refuse to dream because you've been hurt too much. Or you're, you're trying to dream again, but you're a little apprehensive because you're not sure whether God's going to be a part of the dream or not. Or maybe you're just doing good. But in the next few minutes as we sing another worship song, I just want to thank you to think about where you are. And if you're where John was... And you go, God, I just need to know. 
Is Jesus the one? If you're wondering this morning, because you've never accepted Jesus, you go, I've heard this stuff, but I just don't know about it. I don't know if Jesus is really who he says he is, if he will do what he says he will do. And so, maybe you need to accept Jesus for the very first time today. Or you say, I'm going to give you my dreams. I'm going to trust that what you say in your word is true, that you're going to work and you're going to do. You give him yourself. And he takes the old and he gets rid of it. And he makes you new. When you're baptized into Christ, your sins are washed away. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to help you learn to dream again. And to trust in God. I would love to see you make that decision. That would be my dream. That's my dream for everybody. Is that you give yourself to Christ. But maybe you're here and I don't know, you're just, you're confused about dreaming. You're confused about life and where you are and what you're supposed to do. Why don't you ask God for some clarity? Look back through your life, see the times he's worked and say, God, I know you've worked. I've seen you work in my family and friends and I want you to work now in me. So God, just work and do and show yourself to me. And maybe you need us to pray about that because you're struggling. We'll play, pray with you publicly or privately. It's up to you. But if you come and tell us what's going on this morning, we'll gather this church family around you and ask God to work His will in your life. Or if you want to be a part of this church, I like to think maybe we're a church of dreamers. I would love to see us dream and go, God, what do you want us to do in Martinsville and Henry County? What do you want us to do through others in this world? And if you want to be a part of this church, if you're a baptized believer, we'll welcome you. And we're here to help people connect to God, grow in faith, and live to serve. And if you want to be a part of that, man, come and dream with us. Let's see what God will do. But we're going to sing. I'll be over to the side. If you have a decision, anything you need to talk about at all, you come. But let's stand together and let's worship.
beats for me. That's one of those promises that are true about God. That Jesus is in heaven. He is pleading on our behalf. He's stepping in on our behalf and saying, God, here's what they need. They don't know how to express that to you, but here's what they need. Give them what they need. Man, what an awesome promise. So no matter where you are, dark or light, bad places or good places, trust the things you know about God to be true. Listen, I like for you guys to know good things and, and good news when it happens. Uh, if you were here last week, you got to see Molly uh, baptized into Christ uh, after our service, and that was awesome. The party was just beginning. Uh, we had a young man come forward last week during traditional, and he was baptized. His name is Sammy. Uh, he was baptized into Christ right after the service, uh, at traditional service, and then uh, right before church on Sunday night, Anna Kay was baptized into Christ as well. And so when you guys were just chilling, God was was working and great things were happening. So uh, we want you to rejoice with those folks. We want you to rejoice that God's uh, message is being taught and preached and that people are listening to it. And so you'd be excited about what God is doing uh, in this place. Remember, take your bulletin with you. Lots of things for you to sign up, to do, to be a part of. And a lot of things coming next week. Faith in Action, uh, the International Dinner. Great things for us to be together and just enjoy uh, some good fellowship and, and good opportunities to serve. So I pray that you'll take advantage of those and that you will work every chance you get. I love you guys. Dream. Okay, don't be afraid to dream. Let God be a part of them, and I believe great things are going to happen. And when you dream, it's going to affect people out there. Bow your heads, and let's pray. God, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the promises that we are never in this alone. But you are there constantly watching, and you're going to work even in difficult situations. So, Father, bless us, do good things in us, and good things through us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.